Welcome to First Church of the Nazarene here in Fairfield, Iowa. My name is Pastor Howard Ines. May the word of the Lord bring hope, blessings, and peace in the midst of troubled times. Jesus is the answer. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. I have said on several occasions that sin is our greatest enemy. God can handle our frailty as humanity. God can handle our weakness as it relates to our humanity. He's okay with us. Sin is our greatest enemy. And if sin is our greatest enemy, then life is our greatest challenge. On this side of eternity, we want to live well, we want to live right, and we want to be ready that when he comes, we'll be ready to meet Jesus. And what a glorious day that'll be if we're ready. Now I'm going to read today from the book of First John, if you want to start turning that direction. You know, some folks today, they think that to live well is to have a good job. There's nothing wrong with that. Others think that to live well is to have a healthy lifestyle, and that's nothing wrong with that. That's good. That's part of our physical desires, that we be healthy. Uh, some folks think that to live well is to have a lot of money. And while money's not uh, the issue, particularly, that's not the summation of what it is to live well, to live right, to live healthy when it comes to the bigger picture of life. It was John who said, uh, John, the one we're going to read today from the book of 1 John, it's the one who said that he that has the Son, Jesus, has life, and he that does not have the Son does not have life. So you have a pretty clear and a pretty specific point of reference as to what it means to live well, to live right, and that has to do with having the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, you have to understand, when John was writing this book, he was writing to a people who found it to be easy to say things, but maybe not follow through and act on those things. Um, you know, James is the one that said, be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And I could take you through the scriptures and show you the various uh, authors who were dealing with this idea that it's easy to say faith as opposed to walk faith. It's easy to talk Christian living, but it's right to walk Christian living. Life is not about earthly connections. It's about spiritual connections. It's not about meat and potatoes. It's about spirit and truth. And the key thing is not what you own today. It's not how much you have in your bank account. The key thing is, do you have Christ, and are you moving in the direction that Christ wants you to be moving? I think per personally that the tendency or the habit of people, the, the, the easy thing that can happen is to fall back on a verbal statement of faith and a belief that's in our head, but not living out through our particular lives. Now, the scripture I'm going to read for you is 1 John chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 5 through 7, where he says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We don't know if perhaps that in the church of that day that there was conflict as it related to fellowship among the believers, and John was advocating, you know, if you have fellowship with Christ, that's the grounds for fellowship with each other. But because you don't have fellowship with each other, you are jeopardizing what it means to be in this fellowship with, with Christ. Um, 
when he says that if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. It might be such that John had a very definite reason for using such strong language. Perhaps he'd already preached a bunch of stuff. Perhaps he'd already conversed with the folks in a lot of ways. And he's had to come to a point where he's being very firm now and saying, if you say that you have fellowship with Christ and you still walk in sin, walk in darkness, you're lying. That's hypocrisy. And he was dealing with that. On another occasion, he says, uh, how can you say that you love people if you have the resources to help someone in need and you don't use those resources to help that person in need? How can you say the love of God is in you? So he's dealing with that kind of a scenario, that kind of setting. And in this particular passage, well, I didn't read the whole passage, uh, or chapter rather, uh, this small passage of Scripture tells us two things. It gives us two things. One, it gives us God's persona, the character of his life, and it gives a man's response as to either walking in fellowship with him or walking in the darkness. And so I want us to go over that. I want us to stop with the first uh, phrase there where it says, God is light, and in him is no darkness. When the Bible talks about God is light, it just makes me think about how that in the uh, days to come, the Bible says that we're going to be living in a city that needs no sun because Jesus is the light, that radiance of the sun of Jesus Christ. So that is a radiance and a light uh, that has uh, uh, is yet to be uh, revealed to us and yet to be experienced in the joy of being with Jesus in uh, in heaven. But light also is in reference to the light of the gospel as the word of the Lord comes to us, as the spirit of the Lord leads us and brings guidance to us. And when it says that God is light, it means that God is perfectly uh, in his illumination of truth and everything is good. There's not one taint or one aspect of him that is darkened. Now, I just was a doctor not too long ago. I'm not eye doctor. I'm not real happy about my eyesight even now. Um, if I look at you like this with this eye, you don't look too bad. If I look like this eye, you don't look too good. And uh, so I'm trying to get that res- resolved. But God, as light, is 20-20 vision. He's perfect. There's no taint. There's no mar. There's no blemish. Now, I have what they call... I don't know the technical name of it, but they say that the the pumps in my eye are not pumping accurately. So I have to take medication and eye drops to get the pumps to act in so that it will take the fluid out because I have fluid build up in my eyes. God has absolutely zero flaws as it relates to this light that he is. And people saw that the light of Christ, when he came and said, I'm the light of the world. The people came to Jesus. Uh, They flocked to Jesus. They flooded Jesus. You kind of wonder why that's not happening today in our country. Now in Africa, people are just flocking to Jesus and to Jesus events where Jesus is upheld. You wonder today why that's not happening in our uh, culture. Jesus was the source of light. Jesus was the life. Jesus was the hope. The Bible says that they saw, sitting in the darkness, they saw a great light. Jesus was that light, and it was a bright light as the light of love that was shining forth through his life. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus was sinless. Now, that means that he never sinned. He had never uh, had a thought of sin. He never had a desire of sin. Not one ounce, one speck of sin in the life of Jesus. That gives him credibility. But here's the point. As Jesus was the light manifested through God who sent the light, people that were living in darkness, they saw the light. And they were attracted to the light. They came to the light. They walked to the light. The next phrase says, in him there is no dark, dark, darkness at all. There's nothing false, nothing evil, nothing poisonous. Jesus, as the light, 
and no darkness is flawless. I did a little research on diamonds because, you know, diamonds are some perfect. They have the different grades of diamonds. There's actually four, what they call the four C's, the carat, which is the size of the diamond, the color, which is the, uh, the color, and the color is supposed to be clear. It's, you're not supposed to have any yellowish, brownishness in it at all. And most of the color is so immaterial to diamond rings and so forth that you really don't see it a lot. But if you take a magnifying glass and multiply that 10 times, you see that. And if they see it, then it's a flawed uh, diamond if it's 10 times. So that's the color. The cut of the design has to do with uh, the way that they've actually cut that. Sometimes it's chipped or sometimes it has something on it, and that's flawed. But then they have what they call is the clarity of that uh, having to do with the blemishes in the, in, the, uh, in the diamond. They have large diamonds, but very rarely, very rarely do they have any flawless diamonds. And I always say that to say that God is flawless. In him there's no darkness. Isn't that grateful that we have a God that it has, is light, has no darkness in him? He's the one that you can come to. Now, because Jesus is flawless, sinless, has no darkness in him, he has set forth a pattern as it relates to walking in the light. That's what this scripture is about, is walking in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. John eight twelve says, I am the light of the world, this is Jesus. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. He that followeth me. Follow means that we walk with Christ. We follow along with Christ. We are in motion with Christ. We're not just saying things. We're not just believing things. We're actually in activity, in a journey with Christ Jesus, and we walk with him. And he that followeth me, he said, shall not walk in darkness. Now, why do you think that is? For one is because Jesus is the light. So there's always light where Jesus is. And number two, because Jesus will never walk into the darkness in terms of leading us into that uh, place of sin. Jesus would never do that. And so he says, follow, those that follow me shall not walk in darkness. Doesn't mean that we won't experience darkness in our life. Doesn't mean that we won't go through those storm clouds of life, but not walking in the darkness of sin. We never have to go back into sin because he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, and we follow him. And as long as the crowd was following him, they, uh, they felt they were in a good place. Although, when you get close to Jesus, when you see Jesus lifted up as flawless, sinless in him, and there's no darkness and when you see that sunshine of his light and his love, that reflects back and becomes a mirror to us that we of revealing to us that we're not that bright and that we have that darkness. Peter on one occasion said, I am a sinful man. Isaiah, when he saw the Lord in the temple high and lifted up, he said, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people with unclean lips. See, when you see Jesus as he is in his brightness, his holiness, his glory, his sinlessness, his flawlessness, the light that he is, that has a way of revealing to our hearts. And people that saw this great light, they were the ones that were sitting in the darkness. They were the ones that needed a savior. They were the ones that needed a change of, of, uh, of heart and a change of life. And so something happens when we come to the light and when we turn our darkness over to him and let him forgive us and change our hearts and change our lives. It's that light that we're walking. You know that song, I'm walking with my Savior. Every day I'm in his care, I'm walking with my Savior. In his labors I will share. He leads me and I'll follow. His steps will guide my way. I'm walking with the step, footsteps of the Savior. I was going to have us all sing that, but we couldn't, I couldn't find the music to that. So you got a little sample of it anyway. That's I'm walking with my Savior. That's not I believe in Jesus and then just kind of plop. That's I'm walking with my Savior every day. I'm in his care. That means this morning when I got up, 
as I was at my house. I was under the umbrella of God's love, God's light, and that is to radiate in my home, in my church, in my work, everywhere I go. I'm walking with my Savior, Jesus. I wasn't going to say to a people here who is speaking the words that were true, but not living the words, who were believing this, but not living that. That's where John was trying to get under their skin, if he could put it that way. That might not be the best way. That's where John was trying to bring light to their lives. You know, what this journey of faith is about, it's about walking with God, not just talking about God. I believe that's one of the reasons why we should, number one, have a song in our heart all the time, because we live in an ugly world, and we need a Savior every day of our lives. And I think this is where we get our testimonies. It's not about just coming to church and thinking up something. This is about the fact that I've been living my life this week in light of the love of Jesus, in light of the work, uh, the journey with God. And praise the Lord, he's helped me through here. He's helped me through there. He showed me this. He showed me that. And it wasn't on Sunday when we heard the word of the Lord, or it wasn't on Sunday in Sunday school class. It was Thursday night at 12 o'clock midnight when God woke me up. Does God do that stuff anymore? Does God minister to people besides on Sunday? Does God touch the person's heart and life and stirs the soul every week because we are walking and in this journey of faith with God? Or do we find it easy to sit back and to say, well, I believe in Jesus, and then I'm going to take care of some spiritual responsibility, but I'm not going to go all the way and make this a 24 hours a day and all the way that he wants it to be. Now, the Bible goes on, and now John is giving a couple of those responses. He says, now, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. To claim fellowship and practice sin is quite ironic, and it's a deception, not to God, but to the soul. Did you hear that? It said that if we say that we have fellowship with God and we live in sin, we're lying. If there's sin in our life, if we're practicing sin, I was reading in my studies as to the practice of sin. And one of the commentators was referring to the fact that, you know, because we all have struggles with sin, we all have that... Uh, you know, temptation to sin, then the question he was asking was, are you comfortable with the sin that you're living in, if that's the case? Are you sick and tired of it? Are you trying to stay out of it? You're trying to live above it. You're trying to let Christ, the meaning of Christ in your life, make the difference. Is it real, this relationship? I'll probably get myself in trouble because some of you probably won't like this, but there's a, a new TV show on, on uh, cable that has to do with pawn shops. I've been to pawn shops before. Um, this particular show has to do with a big pawn shop. I believe it's out in California. I can't believe all the stuff that people bring in there. I mean, they've bought airplanes. They've bought boats. I mean, they go out and all kinds of stuff. But I've learned this right off the bat. You know, the only thing they're interested in, is it real? Is it authentic? They brought in helmets. They brought in all kinds of different things. And the guy will stand there and say, well, you know, it looks pretty authentic. And I have a friend, and he, he could tell me if this is real or not. And this guy is believing that this is real. This guy's believing that 1866 is the date on it. So he's believing this is real. And so he's, they kind of have this introduction of, you know, he's kind of saying, well, I want to try to sell it for, say, $3,000. And then this guy, pawn shop guy, he gets his friend to come in and look at it. He said, well, it does look to be authentic, but here's why this is a replica. This is why this is not real. The pawn shop guy says to the, uh, to the seller of it, how much do you want for it? Well, 5000 No, not going to happen. It's just interesting watching those guys dealing with people. But the point is, they're looking for, is it real? Do you think Jesus is interested in real 
true Christianity? Do you think Jesus looks down? I mean, Jesus said on one occasion, you know, not everybody says, Lord, Lord's going to make it to heaven. And he talks about lip service. He talks about that. Uh, their heart is far from me. And John's dealing with that in reference to this group of individuals. And he's endeavoring to bring about this sensibility that if we say that we have fellowship with Christ and we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. This is where someone could preach on cheap grace, which claims one thing and practices another. Now, I'm not the one that talks about who's doing what sin or what kind of lifestyle people live. That's not mine for to be judged. But if you say that you have fellowship with Jesus Christ this morning and you know that you're practicing sin in your life, the Bible says that you're lying. And I'm only going to say what the Bible says, folks. You're telling a lie. You're living a lie. And you don't have to live that lie. You don't have to go on practicing the sin in the dark, the secret sins of our lives, and go on practicing that, saying that you have fellowship with Christ. You don't have to do that. You can come to Christ, change of heart, and live new before him. I, I just, I'm kind of done with this point, but I, I feel led to hold on to it just a little bit, and I don't know why, except for to say, as God has brought to my attention here in my spirit. Preachers can live lies. Um, I know preachers who have lost their ministry because they've been uh, online in the church with uh, pornography. The church never did know that until it was found out. I'm telling you something, folks. Preachers are not the only one that can live lies. Parishioners can live lies. If you're living a lie, this is what the Bible says, if you say that you have fellowship with Christ and you walk in darkness, you practice sin, you lie and do not the truth. Then he goes on and says, but... And that's the alternative there. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You know, I didn't understand this for the longest time. I just couldn't figure that out. But the more I studied for this message, it really came clear to me. When it's talking about walking in the light, if we're walking in fellowship with Christ, if we're living out what Christ means for us in our day-to-day -day journey, and we're walking with him, this is the foundation for the kind of fellowship that we need to be having with each other. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. I can say this without, I don't, I don't have, think have any misgivings on this. Churches that split up, churches that are in conflict, churches where people go their separate ways and they don't like each other are churches where somebody's not in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And people aren't walking in the light as God would have them to walk. There is something about Jesus that brings a commonality to faith in Christ. We can move this, uh, this uh, service over into Africa and we can join in, though we wouldn't be able to understand our African friends. We can sing Jesus loves me in our language. They could sing it in their language and we could all get along in a happy way because Jesus is that fellowship that bond of fellowship jesus is where the walls come down in galatians i believe it is he talks about the gentiles and the jews and how they were separate and how they were uh, and hostile but through his love those that wall was brought down i was reading a book or an article or something in reference to uh, why it is that the church over the years has developed a hatred for certain things and certain ones and uh, when Jesus never hated anybody. And one particular incident that, well, actually several, because I've read a little bit about this particular church, but there's a church down south who has gone to various funerals and picketed, and they've, they've gone to homosexual, uh, those folks that died from a homosexual 
homosexuals that died have gone and had these placards and, and, and just had hateful things. I've been at their website. I know exactly. They actually showed up at uh, um, Hope Lutheran Church in Des Moines uh, one time. I wasn't there, but that's the church that my son and uh, Josh and Leah were married in. And Leah's folks go there. It's a good church. I've been there. I've met the pastor. And uh, they showed up there to, to pick it. You know, why does the church hate what Jesus loved? Why do we get kind of a bad taste in our mouth when Jesus loved? He hates the sinner. It's sin, that's right. But he loves the sinner. And you don't find Jesus, in fact, remember the lady that was caught in adultery? Now, this was not a suspicious story. This is not a, you know, make-believe story. This is a real story. They caught her in adultery. And Jesus' judgment? Does anybody condemn you? Could, no, because they all left. And neither do I. I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. You see, when the light of the gospel is in us, when we are walking in the light, when we have the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ on our spirit, we have a whole lot more energy to love each other in the way that Christ would have us to love. Why do you have conflicts in the church? Because you have personalities in the church. No. Well, yes, that's some, some, to some degree. Because you have different agendas in the church. You have different ways of doing things in the church. And by goodness, we're going to stay right here. We're going to do it this way. There's some folks that are afraid to do anything in a church sometimes because they know that they're going to ruffle the feathers of somebody else. I, I had just not too long ago somebody tell a story about they came into a church and they uh, were going to sit down in the pew, but they were afraid to because they were afraid they were going to sit in somebody's spot. <laughs> and I have heard stories of someone actually, a visiting family coming in, sitting down, and like where Ron and Louise would be sitting, and they've sat there a few Sundays. They kind of move around a little bit. That's good. But like if they come in and sat where Ron and Louise were, this family sat down, I've heard stories where somebody would come in and say, you're sitting in my chair or my pew and ask him to get up. Now, if that ever happened to me, I think I'd get up and not just move to a different pew. I think I'd head right back out to the parking lot, get in my car and say, God's not in that place. Why do we take ownership of things? Why do we hold on to things that we want to be ours and we say, this is mine and I'm going to fight for this? I'm... The Bible says that if we have, if we walk in the light and have fellowship with Jesus Christ, we have fellowship one with another. We have the roots, we have the source, we have the dynamics, we have the energy that the fellowship of the faith family will be harmonious and working together. That's what the Bible says. That's what he said, if you walk in the light. All this taking place then, he goes on to say, that as that... Uh, that if we, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And he speaks about then how the cleansing of the fellowship of the body of Christ, the, 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 the power of Christ is, is over all of that. And so then, just as John said, this is the message we've heard from him. This is from Christ. And we're announcing it to you. We're telling it to you today. And I'm repeating it to you again today for whatever reasons that God may have for this message to your heart, God is light. He is bright. He is perfect. The illumination of truth is perfect. There's nothing sour, taint, or flawed in Him. He is perfect. God is light. There's no darkness in Him. And that message goes on to say that if it is that you have, say that you're in fellowship with Christ and you walk in darkness, then that's not true. You're not authentic. The Bible says in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, in Him was life, that's Jesus, and the life was the light of men. The light shined into the darkness and the darkness didn't receive it, comprehend it. Then in John 3, He says, this is the condemnation that lights come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You get some control freak in the church 
who's going to be insist that this is the way we're going to do this because I've been here for a thousand years or this is the way we're going to do this because I'm going to throw a fit if you don't do it this way. You bring that kind of spirit to the church and you'll end up with this kind of thing where it says that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil and the darkness dwells in the heart of those who endeavor to control. I want it my way. And an interesting thing happened not too long ago. It wasn't about control, but it was about feelings. And there was a comment made to me about something in the church, and I kind of had a, a tizzy fit in my emotions, and I kind of made some comments that I wasn't real happy about later, of which I apologized for or, you know, talked about, said, I'm okay, my heart's calmed down. I don't want to be a control freak. But I'm still a human being. <laughs> and you can punch a button and it's going to rub me the wrong way and I can re react, but in my reaction, praise God, I'm sanctified to where that reaction can be shaped and molded by the Holy, by the, uh, Holy Ghost and can lead me to make it right. A lot of stuff goes wrong in the church because men's hearts are darkness, and they hear the light, they hear the truth, they know the truth, but their deeds are evil, and they want it their way, and it's not the way of the cross. The light of the life of Christ is what brings authenticity to us as a people and vindicates us. It went on to say that everyone that does evil hates the light doesn't like to be told that it's walking in the wrong way. Doesn't like to be controlled. Neither do they come to the light. I don't know if that means they neither come to the altar, not this altar, but an altar of prayer and surrender and submit and give that darkness up. Because they don't want their deeds to be proved as, as evil. But he that doeth truth comes to the light that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. So you have there three steps. The walking to Christ, coming to him for salvation, coming to him for forgiveness of sin, coming to him for a changed life. Then you have a walk with Christ in the following and the journey uh, in the light. You have the walk with Jesus in that journey of faith with him. I didn't read this portion, but if you'll look into verse 8 and verse number 9 and 10, it goes on to say that if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. There are folks today that would like to convince us that Life is not about, that sin is not the big enemy. It's just kind of, we're all kind of warped in our thinking. We just need to rethink things. We need to calm our emotions. We need to have a little more finesse about our emotions, but it's not about sin. There are those who claim that there is no sin. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. See, that's the latter part of this, if we say these things and then we don't act out what God has us to act out. If we have a verbal faith, but we don't have a walking faith. If we have a hearing, but not a doing faith. We, we get things all, all fouled up in the church, in our personal lives. And this message went to a people who said, who needed to hear, God's the light. If you say you have fellowship with Christ and you don't you walk in darkness, how can you say that you have fellowship with Christ? That's a lie. You're not living in the truth. Now, he says it stronger than I ever would. <laughs> I don't stand in front of the public people to say, you know, this is a liar situation. But he did. He said, and then if you if you go on to this journey about, you know, it's not my darkness, it's not sin in my life, you know, I don't have that 
He says, then you make God a liar because the Bible says that all have sinned, all come short. We have to accept and acknowledge that, that that day that we come and say, Lord, I've sinned. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Well, I hope that, you know, you'll catch this, that God is the light. There's no, no flaw in that light. He's the perfect illumination of truth, and he wants to walk with us, which is why he sent Jesus, his son, who was the light of the world, that in him was life, and this life was the light that comes to the souls. And this light is to be maintained, this light is to be lived out in real time, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Take Saturday off. No, no, no. you got to live for Jesus on Saturday too. Did you know that? You know, you, you tithe 10%, so you get $1,000, you give God 100 and then you go out and blow it and spend it on whatever you want for the $900. That's not true either. You see, it's all His. He's the Lord and the Master. And He wants our allegiance and our devotion to that degree. And that's what sanctification is about. Making Jesus Lord of our life. Walking in the footsteps of our Savior. Mm -hmm.